Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you all and invite everybody to please turn with me to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, we'll be reading verses 7 through 12 this morning. And you know, whenever you read through the Psalms, you'll notice there's times where David seems to lament these terrible times that have befallen him and things seem bleak and hopeless. And then God sends along this refreshing reminder that he still loves David, still cares about him, and he gives him deliverance. Well, sometimes in Florida, when the summer drags on a little too long, you begin to wonder, has God forgotten about us? And then, then he sends mornings like we've had the last couple days, which have been absolutely beautiful, no humidity. You can sit on your porch and not break a sweat. And you think, God still loves us. All right, very good. Well, hopefully you're all at Galatians chapter 5 by now. Again, we're going to read verses 7 through 12. If you do not have a, a Bible of your own, you are welcome to take up one of the pew Bibles. Turn to page 974, or I'm sorry, 975, and let's hear God's word together. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. With that definitive word being spoken, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We praise you, O Lord, for this beautiful day. We do thank you for the wonderful weather, and we thank you especially for the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. I pray that you would bless this time now in your word. Lord, as we seek to understand the gospel in the scriptures, Lord, we do not come in order to learn several points of how to make our life better. We're not just here to add improvement to our life. We are here to exchange our old life for a new one. We have come to die so that Christ might be alive in us. And I pray that you would work that new life in and through your Son and the message of what He has done this morning. I pray that you would bless every heart here with this refreshing good news. I pray that you would bless our Sunday school team, that you would give them grace and you would give them wisdom for sharing the Lord with the children of this church, and that even with their young age, Lord, would you still reach their hearts with the same message that we need here this morning, and that is the message of Jesus. I ask all of this in His mighty name. Amen. The year is 490 B.C. Darius I is the king of the Persian Empire. He was mightier than any who had come before him. He ruled the known world with an iron fist. And across the sea from Darius of Persia, there was this little nation called Greece. Greece was not a united nation. It was made up of a bunch of city-states. That means that each city independently ruled itself with their own little king. There was no centralized ruler. There was no centralized army of Greece. And one of those city-states was known as Athens. Well, Athens had the audacity to do something to tick off Darius I of Persia. And so Darius vowed that he would burn them to cinders. There would be nothing left of Athens and its columns and its philosophy and its art and its culture. It would all be burned to ash. And so Darius I sent a fleet of somewhere between 20,000 to 100,000 men. Historians debate the exact figure, but it's somewhere from 20 to 100,000 men he sent across the sea to go invade Athens and put them in their place. Now, Athens has only about nine to 10,000 men who are able to meet this number. So drastically, drastically outnumbered. But they marched anyway to defeat or to defend their homeland. And they ended up marching about 26 miles out from Athens to meet Darius and his army at this little seaport town. And there they would do battle, this seemingly hopeless task. But the Athenians needed help and badly. So they sent a runner by the name of Phidippus. Kind of a fun name to say. They sent a runner named Phidippus to go to Sparta. Sparta was about 150 miles away. And the Spartans, now they were known for their warfare. They were the kings of combat. So they thought, if the Spartans will help us, maybe we'll have a chance. And Phidippus runs 150 miles there and then turns around and comes back within two days. And all their hopes were supposedly hung on Sparta coming to their rescue. Well, Phidippus returns, but with bad news. The Spartans refused to help. The Athenians were on their own. Well, you can imagine, meanwhile, back at Athens, 26 miles away, as the, 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 the women of the city and the farmers of the city and all the people back at Athens, they don't know what's going on. 
Remember, this is the day before cell phones and before news network coverage. So they have no idea what's happening. Here comes Darius and his 100,000 men meeting with these nine to 10,000 Athenians. And the people back at Athens have no clue what's going on. And so for the next couple days, it's torturous for them. And it's, they're just looking over the horizon, waiting. Will our own boys come back home? Or are we going to see an advancing Persian army coming to take our city? Will this advancing Persian army, will there be a wake of our dead fathers, husbands, and brothers behind them? And you can imagine them being on pins and needles, biting their fingernails, anxiously waiting. Well, finally, after several days, like a dot on the horizon, they saw a lone figure approaching the city of Athens. One man. Who was it? It was Phidippus, the runner, still running. He had gone to Sparta and back, and now here he is, still running to Athens. And he runs into the city, running, bringing news of the battle, and no fatigue could have stopped him. You would think that a man who had gone through all that would have just collapsed with exhaustion. But no, somehow he was still running. He was still persevering. And he runs into the city. His mission was fixed. His resolve was unbreakable. And he flies into Athens like an eagle on wings with the best news that no one could have hoped to have dreamed for. Athens somehow had won. The underdog had defeated the invading Persian forces. And Darius had retreated back to Persia like a dog with his tail between his legs. And as Phidippus runs into the city, he shouts one word in Greek, Nikomen, from where we get the word Nike, victory, Nikomen, we win. And then this noble, unrelenting runner dropped dead of exhaustion. And the running of Phidippus became legendary. He had tirelessly not only covered the pace from Sparta to Sparta and back, but then he had run this additional 26 miles from this battle to bring the good news to Athens that the battle had been won. The good news of victory. The message he carried was so precious and there was nothing that would distract him or dissuade him to one side or to the other. He stayed focused and he brought this good news. And even though it took his final breath, nothing could stop him. Well, many years later, they were seeking to introduce a new race into the Olympic Games. And in honor of Phidippus, they came up with a 26-mile run that people would participate in. And the name of the run would be named after the city that he had run from, the city of Marathon. And so he ran 26 miles from Marathon to Athens. And that's where we get the word marathon today, of a 26-mile run, because it was the unrelenting race of Phidippus to bring this good news to the people of Athens. Well, in Galatians, we've been studying an even greater good news, the good news that Jesus has conquered the foes of sin and death, that this humble carpenter from Nazareth went up against the innumerable odds of hell and death and Satan and his hordes and returned triumphant. Jesus achieved the victory for us, and now the fruits of his victory are received by us by grace alone, through faith alone, in the resurrection of Jesus alone, not by our good works. Last week in chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, we saw how this gospel brings liberty. There is great freedom in what Christ has done. Freedom from having to earn our salvation by law. Freedom from the dominion of sin. Freedom from the fear of death. Now with our ankles unshackled, we can run free with this glorious message. We bear news that was even greater than the news that Phidippus carried. But, but there are those who would call us off that path, who would try to divert us from our race and put us back into chains. As we run along this Christian road, there are many voices and many distractions, all calling us down avenues of false gospels and false religions. And some of them seem quite persuasive. Some of them sound quite appealing, but they all have one thing in common. Every single one of those various roads all lead back to the dungeon of slavery. They seek to deter us from that gospel path of freedom and good news. So now in Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 through 12, we will be encouraged to run with perseverance in the way of the cross, just as Phidippus ran with perseverance to bring the good news to Athens. We run with an even greater message. We run with an even greater message of victory what Christ has done. Because that path of the cross, the gospel road that we are to travel, that is the only means back into a right relationship with God. And so there's several things we'll be examining in the text this morning. Five things we're going to look at. And the first one is this. We see it in verse 7. We can go to point number one. Faithfulness to the gospel is like running a race. 
This is, an, this is an analogy that's made all the time through Scripture. Look at what it says in verse 7. You were running well. He's referring to their trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ for salvation. You were going steady in your confidence in Christ and in Christ alone. And this Christian life is frequently compared to a race. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25 says, Do you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run, that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. What Paul said there in 1 Corinthians is that if you are to be an athlete and you are to run, there must be self-control. There's things that maybe don't sound very appealing that you're going to have to do, and there's things you might want to do that you're going to have to say no to. And as we are on the gospel trail, there will be many voices that will beckon us to false gospels, maybe messages that tingle our itching ears, and we feel the desire to go after them, just like someone training for a marathon might really want to pig out on a quart of ice cream once in a while. But you have to understand that is detrimental to the race that I am running. And so there is self-control needed to stay on this straight and narrow path. And Paul even hearkens to the Olympic Games there. He says that those who run do it for a perishable wreath. This was sort of, uh, it was a green leaf of victory that the winners of the Greek races would wear on their head with pride. And he's saying, that's perishable. That wreath is going to dry up and wither and it won't mean anything. But the gospel road has an eternal crown waiting on the other side. That's why Paul would say later when he wrote 2 Timothy, he was in his cell writing his final letter, knowing he was about to die. Paul would be beheaded for the gospel and he would write to young Timothy and 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I've kept the faith. I stayed on the gospel path all these years. And Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says something similar. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. We run with our eyes fixed on Jesus. And so what we need to know about this passage then is that to deviate from the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves sinners by grace alone, through faith alone, in his finished work alone, to deviate from that is to deviate from the race. It's to deviate from the gospel itself. The gospel is the road on which we trek. The gospel is not simply the first set of beliefs you accept at your conversion and then you run the Christian race. The gospel is the trail on which we conduct the entire journey. And I think one of the allegories that best pictures this idea of the gospel journey and the many distractions that come up from it is John Bunyan's landmark book, The Pilgrim's Progress. He wrote it in 1678. You've probably heard me talk about it before. If you still haven't read it yet, I encourage you to do so. If the old English is overwhelming, there are some really good modern English versions you can get. But basically the premise of the Pilgrim's Progress is there's this protagonist named Christian who is leaving behind the city of destruction and headed towards the celestial city of glory. And on his way, as he's on this trail, there's a very straight and narrow path he's to travel to get to this city of glory. And there are many foes along the way who try to lure him and distract him, take him to the right and to the left. And what I love about Bunyan's work is that he shows a variety of traps, a variety of tempts. Sometimes it's with legalism. Sometimes it's somebody telling Christian, hey, you have to adhere to all these commands and rules in order to be good enough for the celestial city. Sometimes the temptation was licentious, carnal living in places like Vanity Fair, where it's come and indulge the flesh. The temptations we face to leave the gospel path are many and varied. But what they all had in common is they were all deviations from that exclusive path. And such is the danger faced by Christians of all ages to deviate from the gospel road. Well, we read in verse 7, the Galatians had been running faithfully. But look, look at that fat, juicy past tense word there, were. You were running faithfully. It's as if the racetrack coach might have said, you were making record time. You were going strong. But that's not the case anymore. Galatians, you've slackened your pace. You've started deviating off to another trail. The whole point of this letter that Paul's writing is they were being lured aside off of the gospel road down another path altogether. They were veering off the straight and narrow. And so as Paul says here, they were hindered in verse 7. The, the Greek word hindered here means to cut into. It means to interrupt or to impede something, to prevent someone's course by cutting them off. You might think of somebody butting in on a waltz. You know, you're having this romantic 
dance with the love of your wife and then some just jerk jock steps in and butts in on the dance and steals your girl away. He, he interferes with this thing that's going on. That's what the word hindered means. Or you might think of the, uh, the classic story Pinocchio, right? And most of us are probably most familiar with the old Disney cartoon. And you think of how Pinocchio has been given this task by his father. Here's your books. Here's your apple. Go to school. There's the route to school. Take your books. Give the apple to your teacher. All right, son, go do it. And as Pinocchio is on his merry little way, here come these two ruffians, Honest John and Kitty. And Honest John does not live up to his name because he's not honest at all. And he tries to dissuade Pinocchio. Oh, you know, going to school, that's fine. But you know what's really cool, little puppet boy, is you should go perform in the theater and make me lots of money too. And so he tries to convince Pinocchio. And there's this great scene there where as he's talking to Pinocchio, he takes the apple that was supposed to be from Pinocchio's teacher, and Honest John starts eating the apple as he's talking to Pinocchio. And it's kind of this symbolic I'm your teacher now. And so Pinocchio is now listening, not to the voice of his father, not to the, the teacher, but now he's listening to the dissenting voice of Honest John. And it leads him into a whole lot of trouble. That's what's happening here. They've been hindered. And Paul says, you were running well, but now someone has hindered you with a false gospel. Well, who would do that? I mean, who, who has the authority to turn a person from the road of God? Who has the authority to contradict what God has declared. Who is the authority to determine a new trail? God says, this is the way, walk in it. And who thinks they can come along and say, no, it's actually down this way? Who can offer you a better route than the gospel? Well, now we come to our second point. And we see, verse, and we see verses uh, 7 and 8. There are many voices trying to turn us down many roads, but there are ultimately two calls at the end of the day, and that's it. The call of God through Jesus Christ and everything else. He asked this question in verse 7, who is it that's calling you? And then he says in verse 8, it's not from God, I can tell you that. Whoever this voice might be coming from, whatever religious teacher, whatever leader, whatever influential person, I don't care how much clout they have, I don't care how many followers they have, I don't care how many PhDs, I don't care how many books, I don't care how many followers on YouTube, whoever is telling you this, it's not God. They are setting themselves up as a false God, a false message of salvation, because he says, God was the one who called you to that narrow gospel road in the first place. God was the one who called you to this path. It was through the call of the gospel that God brought you onto this trail. So whoever is telling you to leave the trail is not of God. So what he's saying here is, I think he's really showing that there's two different voices at work. There's the one who called you originally, and then there's these other voices that are trying to lead you astray. There's two calls, two voices at work here. The call of God that's given through the good news of salvation through Christ alone. And then there's the call of all other hopes, all other false religions, all other false gospels. And so he's saying, which one are you going to listen to? You know, there was a really tragic series of events right after the end of the Civil War. And you know, at the end of the Civil War, that means that all of the slaves in North America were now set free across the board. What a great message of liberty that they who had, had lived in shackles for all these years, now had freedom and were now being rightfully given the same rights and benefits as everybody else. Well, what happened is after the war was over, there were a lot of people who didn't want to let go of their slaves. And so what they would do is they, they would lie and they would tell their slaves, no, you're not free to go. Sorry. No, the, the war hasn't been won. Nope. You're, you, you still belong to me. And so they had these flow. Here's, they should have an open door to freedom. But now there's these deceitful voices saying, no, there's no life for you down that road. You stay right here with me. And in, in many ways, that's exactly what these false teachers were trying to do. They were trying to give false paths that ultimately kept people in slavery. And so what we need to know is that as we seek to follow God's gospel call, there will be other competing voices that arise. There will be others who will say, no, not that way, back in here, back into chains. And notice how Paul says of the Galatians in verse 8, he says, they were persuaded. He says, this persuasion that has won you over, they were persuaded by the voice. That means that these Judaizers who came along with this works-based salvation, they didn't throw a sack over the Galatians' head and force them to do it. They weren't like, you know, there was no Spanish Inquisition where it's, let's torture you until, until you confess. They were persuaded. That means that the Galatians were lured quite willingly because there was something about the false message that they found appealing. And that's the dangerous thing about false gospels is that they are not often advocated at sword point. It's usually because the pen is mightier than the sword and the power of persuasion is used to lure people aside. 
This word persuasion, it's the same word that's used in Matthew 27, 20, where it says the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Here's the crowd and the chief priests come along and they woo them over and say, we'll take Barabbas rather than Jesus. That's what the Judaizers are doing. They persuade them to say, we'll take something or someone else rather than Jesus. Like the voice of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. This alternate call beckoning us down the wrong path can usually be quite enticing. And so as we are going down this gospel road, we have to be very careful that the GPS voice we're following is the one who originally called us in the first place and, and not a deviant. Now, as we journey through this life, there's going to be many, many desires, opportunities, and offers that, that we encounter. So in a way, there's going to be many calls, many temptations, many competing systems, beliefs, and priorities that will beckon to us. But in God's economy, you can actually reduce all of the calls you hear on a daily basis, whether it be the influences of social media, of, of, of false prophets, whoever it is, all those influences, all those voices, all those paths that are beckoning to you, you can ultimately reduce them down to two. In God's economy, there are only two paths. There is God's call through His Son in the gospel, and then there's the call of everything else. All of the varied temptations and false gospels that you and I face, think about, think about them as just different vocal pitches of the same cunning call of the serpent. Exact same call, just using a variety of pitch and tone in order to do it. But they all lead to the same place. So remember this, Christian. Every day of your life and in every situation you face, there will always be those two voices calling you. The voice of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ and everything else. And these, these voices, by the way, these calls, they don't just appear in those big moments. It's like, you know, that moment where you had to decide, am I a Christian or am I something else? It doesn't just come at those big watershed, life-changing moments. In fact, very often, those two calls present themselves every day and in even the smallest of situations. And what makes them so tricky, like in the Galatians case, is that it's not always a matter of choosing religion or secularism. The Judaizers made a very devout, upright offer. You can live a holy life. You can live a righteous life. You can even keep Jesus if you want to. So their choice wasn't between atheism and religion. It was a certain belief about God and how God worked. So you can stay within the bounds of religion and even stay within the bounds of calling yourself a Christian and still depart from the exclusive gospel of Jesus Christ. So in every situation you face in life, Christian, every single face, every single situation, you will face contrasting calls between the work of man on one hand and the free grace of Christ on the other. The daily things you face can contain within them these competing calls unto Christ or on something man-centered. So for example, let's say you're working at your job and you're doing really well. You're keeping your clients happy, business is pouring in, and your bank account is looking really nice and nifty. Well, we should thank God when that happens. But maybe you see that and you think that that's evidence that God favors you. Maybe that's evidence you think, hmm, I must be living a really, really good life because this is how God is rewarding me for all my good works because He's blessing me with material prosperity. But then the flip side of that is maybe you've run into hard times. Maybe it's hard to make ends meet. The market and the economy isn't what it was. You're wrestling with your job. It's hard to make house payments. And you begin to think, oh no, what did I do? You know, I'm displeasing God in some way. And when you fall into that mentality, you're looking at your work and your career and your financial situation, and you're gauging it on the basis of, I'm made right with God because of my performance rather than by the grace of His Son. Perhaps your church involvement. You come to church because it gives you a chance to feel religiously good about yourself. I've participated in my weekly or, or even several times a week participation rather than seeing coming and gathering with the people of God as the chance to die and receive the life that only comes to the grace of Christ's death and resurrection. But if you go into life with this mentality that my standing with God is based upon my performance, it casts this shadow over, over every single situation you face. If we understand my, my righteous standing before God is based on what Christ has done for me, then I am now free to love others, and I'm free to commit myself to my marriage, not in order to earn God's love or favor, but as a reflection of the love He has for me. So which call you listen to affects the way you view every single thing in life. Your work, your church, your marriage, your children, every single thing about yourself. And that's because every one of us is running 
towards something. You will not find a human being on this earth who is not running towards something. The only question is what? Psalm 16.4 warns about the sorrows of those who run after another God. Isaiah 5.11 warns to those who rise early in the morning to run after strong drink. Some sort of carnal indulgence, some sort of uh, addiction. Isaiah 59.7 warns about those whose feet run to evil. Every one of us is running, but don't think that just because you're running, that means you're going in the right direction. It must be the gospel call that we're pursuing. Let's look at point number three. As we see that leaving the path always affects those running with us. Look at what he says in verse 9. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. He says, listening to these false teachers, buying into the works-based legalism of the circumcising Judaizers will have the effect of leaven through bread. You know, you put just a little bit of leaven inside the bread, and it works its way through the entire batch. Now, the Bible uses this analogy actually many times. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. Jesus actually used leaven in a loaf to describe the kingdom of God in Matthew 13 and in Luke 13. He compared the kingdom to this tiny little bit of leaven that starts small and then eventually permeates and takes over the entire loaf. He says that's the nature of God's kingdom. It starts small, Jesus and his disciples. The gospel goes out over the centuries. The gospel call goes out and the kingdom of God spreads into every nation, tribe, and tongue. We've seen that happen. That's a good way in which this yeast spreads. But sometimes it's used in a bad way. Jesus warned about the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees in places like Matthew 16, Mark 8, and Luke 12. He compared their self-righteousness and their hypocrisy to a contagious yeast that will spread. If you learn from them, he says, you will be the inheritor. You will catch the contagion of their self-righteousness. And so he compares the same thing to listen to the Judaizers here. Now, here's a reason why you have to take verses 7 to 8 so seriously. Because tolerating the dissenting, persuasive voices of false gospels, it is not just personally detrimental to you. Very often, as Christians, we think that, well, what I believe or what I do, it affects me only. Paul says, it does not. You accept this in, and it's going to spread everywhere else. Your faith will never be restricted to just you. What we believe about God, what we confess about Jesus, how we seek to be made right with God, that always impacts others in the Christian community. Why? For the very simple fact that we are not running this race alone. We are not running by ourselves. We are running as part of a squad. You know, I've been running a lot. My dad got me into running when I was about 12 years old, and I've loved doing it for years. And I'll tell you, there's something very different about when you're running by yourself versus when you're running with another person or, or even with a team. There's a certain layer. There, first of all, there's, there's better accountability when you're running with other people, but there's also this understanding that what I do will affect the people around me. If I'm running by myself and I'm getting lazy or I'm getting a side ache or a cramp and I decide to slow down the pace, big deal. It's just me. But if I'm running with a team, that's going to impact the whole rest of my team as well. Actually, one of the most memorable times we did that was there was a race that they might still do. I don't know. It's called Tough Mudder. And that's, that's 12 miles of mud, obstacles, and just gory glory. I mean, it was, it's, it's miserable, it's terrible, and it is wonderful. And there was one year where, being as tough as she is, Trina actually ran it with me. It was me, Trina, one of my friends, his wife, and then another friend. And the five of us ran as a team. And it was great. And you had to remember that the pace I keep and what I decide to do in this run does not just affect me. It affects the people around me as well. And so we are reminded of that when it comes to the gospel as well. When we let in false versions of the gospel, it does have a ripple effect to our entire church community. That's why God warned Old Testament Israel so fervently, do not make alliances or assimilate with all of the idolatrous cultures around them because of how easily it would slip in and would impact the entire nation, which is exactly what happened. And that's exactly why Israel and Judah got hauled into captivity. That's why the book of Proverbs warns us to be very careful about which friends you choose, because the people you're around have an effect on you, and you in turn have an effect on other people. If you allow even a fleck of false gospel yeast, it can germinate invisibly, slowly, but effectively. Fourthly, God will be faithful to preserve His people in the race, and He will be faithful to punish those who would lead them astray. The true gospel will prevail. Look at verse 10. 
He says, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and that the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. So if you're watching a race, perhaps it's a track and field race. Your kid is doing track and field and you're watching them. Maybe you're a NASCAR fan, in which case my condolences. And you're watching it and your guy, whoever he is, is losing. That can be quite nerve-wracking as you're watching this. It leaves you biting your fingernails, wondering how it's going to turn out. And although Paul, he's agitated by the fact that these Galatians that he loves so much are leaving the path. If he was watching it like a race, he's like, you guys, you're losing. And he's agitated by that. But notice his tremendous confidence here. For all of Paul's agitation, and Paul in holy zeal has gotten pretty hot and bothered a few times through this letter. And yet in that agitation, Paul expresses this confidence, and he has confidence in two things in verse 10. First, he has confidence that God will be faithful to preserve his people, in this case the Galatians, through the race. And secondly, God will be faithful to punish those who would lead them astray. So two things he's confident of. God will preserve his people, and God will punish the dissenting voices. Two ways that he trusts God's faithfulness. God will preserve, and God will punish. Although Paul's concerned for the Galatians, he's confident that this will not result in a total departure. You guys got off the trail, but I'm confident the Lord will bring you back on the straight and narrow. And there's a bit of a wordplay here that actually gets lost in our English translations. The, remember back in verse 8, he used that word persuasion. In, Greek, in verse 8, he talked about the persuasion that had won them over to these false teachers. Well, that word persuasion and the word translated confidence here in verse 10 are actually very, very similar. In fact, the word persuasion in verse 8 in the original Greek is actually a derivative of the word here in verse 10. And I think Paul is using these two words in such close proximity on purpose. It's a bit of a word play. He's basically saying, I am persuaded in the Lord that your persuasion by the Judaizers will not last. You've been convinced by these false teachers, but I am convinced that what you're convinced of will not last. Now, this is really helpful because on one hand, Paul's been warning and exhorting the Galatians over and over again, don't stray from the gospel. He rebuked them in chapter 3, verse 1, and called them, O foolish Galatians. He commanded them in chapter 5, verse 1, stand firm. He's giving them commands, and he is, uh, he's giving them this giant appeal in order to change their minds. This letter is one big attempt to call them back. He assumes there really is this thing called human agency that he must appeal to. And yet at the same time, notice the language he uses here. He's calling them. He's exhorting them. He's appealing to human agency. Turn back. But then look at what he says in verse 10. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. Where does Paul's ultimate assurance that they will return to the gospel, where does it lie? Is it in their own intelligence? Is it in their own cleverness? Is it even in their own human gumption and resolve? No. Remember, Paul said they were foolish. He described them as being under witchcraft. If Proverbs makes anything clear, it's that you don't trust fools. Paul's trust is not in the ability of the foolish Galatians to find their way back. His trust is in the Lord. That's where his confidence lies. You guys belong to God. God bought you with the precious blood of his own son, and he will not let you fall away. He will bring you back. And so here within this verse, we see, the, the I think, the unity of two doctrines that people often wrongly pit against each other. On one hand is the real agency of human beings. We are called, we are commanded, we are warned, we are exhorted to do things. But at the exact same time, we see the absolute sovereignty of God. We see that if this is to happen, it is not ultimately going to be their own willpower. It's going to be God doing the work in them. God will bring about His faithful work through the warnings of Paul to bring the Galatians back. Underneath Paul's appeal throughout this entire letter, and it's a real appeal, and he's, he's asking them to respond properly. But underneath that appeal is this resting confidence, not ultimately in them, but in Almighty God. If Paul's entire hope for the Galatians was wrapped up in their ability, I don't think he would speak with the same confidence. Remember, he's called them foolish. He's called them bewitched. He's equated their move to Judaism with a return to paganism. When you read everything else Paul says, he doesn't sound that confident in the Galatians, but he does speak of confidence. What kind? Confidence in the Lord because the Lord will be faithful to preserve His people in Christ. But then the other thing he's confident of 
He says that the one troubling you will bear the penalty. That is, the ones who are advocating this false gospel, they will receive judgment for this. Now, the question is, is he referring to a temporary judgment or to an eternal judgment? The word penalty or judgment is used in a variety of ways in the New Testament. Sometimes it's God disciplining His own people. Sometimes it's a, a temporary judgment on humans and society. Sometimes it refers to eternal damnation. It all depends on the context. And the context doesn't actually tell us. So we don't know what kind of judgment He has in mind here. But here's the point. What we do know is that God does not let distortions of the gospel slip under the radar. There will be consequences for the false teachers one way or the other. He's basically saying God will not let these vandalizers slip in and mess up his property and not deal with it. He will deal with them in time. So reasons for confidence. God will preserve his people and God will punish those who distort the gospel. And what both these things have in common God's faithfulness to preserve and God's faithfulness to punish is that the gospel prevails in the end. Like Paul said in Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. No human attempts will ultimately be able to thwart it. That's why we can rest in this gospel. That's why Paul said in Romans 1.16 and 17, he wasn't ashamed of it because it's the power of God, because it can't be stopped. That's why we can, no matter how persuasive those other voices are, that's why we don't need to listen to them and stay on the gospel road, because we can be convinced that it is God's gospel, and God's gospel is the one that is preserved in the end. This is what God himself will defend and vindicate in the end. It is not the calls of everyone else. It is God who has called us to this gospel. Reason for confidence. All right, fifth and finally. Our last point, the road of the cross is offensive to man's pride, but it's the only one that provides access to God. Look what he says in verse 11. He says, if I were preaching circumcision, which is what the Judaizers were doing, the Judaizers were saying you have to be circumcised and obey the law of Moses in order to be made right with God. Paul says, if I did that, then he said the offense of the cross has been removed. Now, in our day, removing something offensive actually sounds pretty noble. Right? You have... Uh, Disney has done, if I, whenever my kids go to watch some of the old Disney movies, there's always like these disclaimers at the beginning, like, hey, we know some of the content may be found offensive to people, so we're putting this disclaimer, you know, that we shouldn't have made these cartoons all these years ago. Uh, for us, it's considered a noble thing to eliminate things that cause offense. When something is offensive, that's like the worst possible harm you could do nowadays. And very often in our, our culture, we use being offended as sort of a bargaining chip to get whatever we want. So for us, it's like, yeah, get rid of the offensive things, right? We, we should tolerate everything and should never cause offense to anybody. But why then does Paul say, don't get rid of the offensive bit? You keep that intact. Why? Well, the Greek word translated offense here is scandalon. And that's from where we get the English word scandal. A scandal is a moral event that causes public outrage. The cross is a scandal. It outrages people. It makes people upset. It offends people. And it needs to. Because he says, you remove the scandal of the cross, you remove the work and the power of the cross altogether. Why? Again, our instinct might be to get rid of things that cause offense. Yet Paul not only admits the cross is offensive, but then says that's a good thing. And says you should not remove that. How very politically incorrect of him. Why would he do that? Why is the cross scandalous? Well, here's why. Because the message of circumcision, and remember, he pointed out in the last section that circumcision is shorthand for salvation by law. He said, if you accept circumcision, you are under the law to earn justification that way. So a, a system of works, a system that circumcision represents, it's not offensive to man. Why? Because a system of works actually has to appeal to the goodness and ability of man. That's why people won't meet it with hostility. If you go out and tell people, you know, be good, and you'll go to heaven someday. Most people will not actually object to that because we kind of naturally assume that's how it works. Oh, yeah, I'm a good person. I go to heaven. People like that. Why do people like that? Because it appeals to our own ability. When you tell someone, go be good and you'll get to heaven, it puts all the power with them. I've got the strength. I'm, I'm better than everybody else. Right? This guy down the road, he might go to hell because he's worse than me but I'm a good person. And so when I get to heaven, I'm going to deserve it. That's why we like the message of law. We like the message of works because it appeals to ourselves because now I am the crafter of my own salvation and that makes me feel really good about myself. 
But the cross, which is at the center of this road that God has called us to, the cross is deeply offensive. Why? Because it's an offense to our strength and capability. That's why Paul said in verse 8 that the message of the false teachers was so persuasive because they were able to tell the Galatians, you've got it within you. You have the power within yourself. You can earn it. You are good enough. When over here you have the gospel saying, we're all a bunch of rotten sinners who need to be saved. You can't do it yourself. Someone has to do it for you. And our pride doesn't like that. We uh, This past Wednesday at Youth, we talked about the issue of Mormonism. That's what we discussed. And uh, w- one of our youth raised a really good question because we were talking about all the requirements for salvation in a Mormon system. It's not just believing in Jesus. There's then all these things that you have to do in order to earn salvation. And one of the students very insightfully asked, well, if, if that list is so extensive and so long, why would anybody embrace that? Why would Mormonism be such a big, growing deal? Well, here's why. Because it appeals to people's capability. It makes them feel good about themselves. It makes them feel like I earned my salvation and that other guy who's going to hell didn't because there's something about me that's better than him. Because man in his fallen nature likes the message of works that says you are good enough and you deserve a reward. That stokes our ego. But the message of grace, the message of the cross says you can't do it. You're a sinner only deserving judgment. You need someone else to do it for you. That hurts our pride. We don't like needing assistance. If I'm trying to carry a heavy object and someone says, can I help? I should respond with gratitude, but in my flesh, my first instinct is, are you questioning my man card? Because I think that help is synonymous with weakness, and I don't like that. The same is true when it comes to our salvation, but it's only by the grace of God given through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross that we can stand before God, and that hurts people's egos. That's a scandal because it's telling people you can't do it. So Paul's saying, if I were to preach salvation by circumcision or by any other work, the offense of the cross would be removed. It would make people feel really good about their own abilities. But to remove the cross from the gospel would not make it gospel at all. Because gospel means good news. And the good news is that God has done for us in His Son what we could not do ourselves. The message in which we run is that Jesus is the victor. You remember we talked about the first marathon runner in in ancient Greece, right, who kind of set that. He ran that 26 miles back to Athens. His message was not, I bring good news, take up your swords and fight because you're going to defeat the Persians. The good news was the battle has already been won and I can run with this message of victory of Nike because it's already been accomplished. And now you guys get to enjoy the benefits of the victory. And as a quick note here, when Paul talks about the offense of the cross, we need to make sure we clarify this. He is not talking about delighting and offending people simply for the sake of offending them. You know, sometimes as Christians, we get this weird kick out of, you know, intentionally going out of our way to offend others. And then if they respond negatively, we can, you know, say that we're being persecuted or something. Uh, Paul isn't talking about being offensive just for offense's sake. That's not noble. We can't use it as a cover to be a jerk and then cry victim when people respond negatively. The litmus test, there's a good kind of offense and a right kind of offense. And the litmus test for right offense is not, people are mad at me. But it's, are we preaching the message of sin, Christ crucified for sinners, and the necessity of the cross for salvation? You don't need to dress that up with offense. You preach it to fallen man, and it's going to already strike a hard blow all on its own at our ego. And then we come to the last verse of of our text today, verse 12. So he's saying you have to run in this gospel road of the cross. Don't empty the cross of its its power, and its power is the very thing that offends people. You need that offense. You need that power. That's where our salvation lies, that we can't do it. Jesus did it. And then he says in verse 12, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Now the Greek word emasculate means to chop off. It's the same word that Jesus used in Mark 9, 43, when he said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. A total removal from the body. So what Paul is saying here is, those guys who are telling you that you need to be circumcised in order to be justified, in order, you know, to be circumcised, it was just cutting off the foreskin. He's saying, I wish they'd go the whole distance and just lop the whole male organ off. Sir, sorry to be frank, but that's what Paul says here. Circumcision was just the removal of one piece. 
Paul says, you may as well go and hack everything off. Now, this strikes us because this sounds less like a dignified apostle of Christ and more like a crass middle school boy. What's his point here? Well, I think his point is this. Several things. Well, two things. We'll go with two things. First, I hear in this a lot of echoes of sort of the taunts that Elijah gave to the prophets of Baal. You remember that story where there was this basically this competition where there was Elijah and he built an altar to Yahweh, and then there was the prophets of Baal and they built an altar to Baal, and both parties would call on their respective deities to send fire, and whichever deity lit the altar, that would be a testimony of, of his reality. That, that's who would be the true God. And the prophets of Baal went first, and the Bible tells us that they went from morning all the way into afternoon, and they're cutting themselves, they're slicing themselves, they're dancing in pools of their own blood, screaming till their voice is hoarse, trying to get Baal's attention. And Elijah's over there being a little buster. He's mocking them. He's like, shout louder. Maybe he can't hear you. You know, maybe he's taking a nap. Maybe he's in the restroom. I don't think he can hear you. You've got to ramp it up. He's like, go ahead, cut yourself more. Let more blood flow. Dance harder. Scream louder. Blow out your vocal cords. He's not going to hear you. It's not going to do a lick of good. And so in a similar way, Paul is saying, you think circumcision is going to get God's attention? You think circumcision is going to make you right with God? It, it's not going to work. Keep going. Go ahead, almost like mocking them. Do more. Lop everything off. Cut off everything. That's not going to get God's attention either. There's only one way. It doesn't matter how much you inflict on yourself or what sort of big grand things you do to get God's notice. There's one way and one way only, and that's through Jesus Christ. And that's it. But then I think the second reason why he says this is, I think he's actually hearkening back to Deuteronomy chapter 23. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1, listen to what it says. And I apologize, uh, just giving you a heads up. You'll see what I mean. Deuteronomy 23, 1 says, No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, called the Septuagint, that Paul and his readers would have read, the word cut off in Deuteronomy 23 is the exact same word that Paul uses here in Galatians 5. Well, what is this a reference to? Why did God put that in the law? Like, did that happen often in ancient times? Like, were there that many accidents with bulls and building blocks? Like, was this a recurring thing? Well, the reason why God even brings it up is because I don't think he's just talking about accidents. He's talking about what I think was a very intentional ritualistic practice of the idol-worshiping pagan nations. Castration was a form of idol worship that many men would engage in. They would devote themselves as priests to these false gods, and to show their commitment, they would castrate themselves. And so the point of Deuteronomy chapter 23 is it's saying that if any man had emasculated himself in idol worship, he could not be admitted into God's presence. That actually kept you from communing with God. This, this commitment to idols by mutilating your body, it would bar you from certain access. And that's why I think Paul is equating it with the circumcision of the Judaizers. He's saying, just like the castrated pagans couldn't stand before the Lord in the Old Covenant, so too those who now try to be justified by circumcision in the New Covenant will not be able to stand before Him either. The Judaizers thought that circumcision got them closer to God Paul says it's actually moved you farther away. He says you may as well be emasculated heathens with no access to God at all. Why? Why do they have no access to God? Because they've removed the exclusive necessity of the cross. And the cross is the only way to God. The cross is the only road to the celestial city. The gospel of Jesus dying for sinners and rising again is our only access point to God. You remove Christ, you remove the gospel, you remove the offense of the cross, there's no access to God. If you refuse to come by way of the cross, he says, you are outside the assembly of the Lord. The road of the cross is the only way there. Now, I'm going to ask the ushers to bring forward the Lord's Supper in just a moment. And as we conclude, I want us to leave with this thought. Let's come back to this idea of of running, of running the gospel road. Here's the irony of the gospel road. What I don't want you to hear is this. God saves us by grace, and now it's all up to us to run the gospel road. God gets you in by grace, And now the running is all up to you because we need that gospel to run on that gospel road. We run based on the message that we can't run. The message is that we are incapable of running ourselves. And it is the gospel message that we can't run that then provides us the ability to run through Jesus Christ. 
I want to close with this. I want to read you some song lyrics and then a Bible verse, and then I'll have Pastor Chris come up. There is a wonderful Christian artist by the name of Caroline Cobb. You've never listened to her, look her up. And she does a song called There is a Mountain. And listen to the lyrics from this song. There is a mountain only the lame can climb. There is a table that only the hungry find. Only the beggar will have the currency when need is all you need. There is a victory that only the conquered gain. There is a glory you get when you give up your name. Oh, the peace when you finally yield your fight and in surrender rise. The only way to run on this gospel path is to regularly present before the Lord, I'm not capable of running. I need the offense of the cross, Jesus my substitute, to fuel and source me in this run. I'm going to read this text and then I'll have Pastor Chris come up and close us out and the ushers bring forward the Lord's Supper. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 30 and 31. It says, Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Youths and young men, they're considered in the prime of strength, the prime of human ability. And he's saying even they get tired. Even someone like Phidippus can only run so many miles before he drops dead. That's as far as human ability will get you. But he says those who trust in the Lord, who wait on him and put all their trust in what Christ did to the cross and empty tomb, he says they're the ones who mount up on wings like eagles. They're the ones who run and do not grow weary. Church, let us run well. But the only way we can do that is if we are running on the narrow path of the cross and what Christ did for us there. I'm going to ask Pastor Chris to come forward and conclude our service and the ushers to bring forward the Lord's Supper.